Okay, we're in uh, the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20, we're on page 237 in our notebook, if you join me there. I call this lesson, Paul, a brief biography. Now, since uh, the introduction of of Saul at the end of chapter 8, and then obviously his conversion in chapter 9, we have learned an awful lot about this particular individual named Paul. In chapter 13, I believe it was verse number 9, his name Saul was then changed. He's, uh, from that point on, he's known as Paul the Apostle throughout the rest of the book of Acts and obviously through his writings, through his epistles and the like. But we're going to look at some things here in this particular chapter that I think um, look at them as a, of, of a more personal nature in what Paul was like. Look at his character, his personality, uh, the things that he did, rather than his travels, his exploits, and necessarily doctrinal issues. Look at the person or the personality of Paul the Apostle himself. In Philippians chapter 3 and Acts chapter 22, we learn uh, some of the other details of Paul's life that uh, um, maybe when we're reading through the book of Acts, we take for granted. But Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he may trust in the flesh, Paul says, I more. Now we learn something about him. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. So we learn uh, some things about Paul, his, of his uh, personality, of historical nature of Paul the Apostle here. Men and brethren, let's look at Acts 22. Men and brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith. So we learn some more about Paul. I am verily a man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way, the way, that is, Jesus is the way, this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished." And it came to pass that as I made my journey, and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell unto the ground, and I heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So <clears throat> we've been studying Paul and his uh, journeys, his exploits, his missionary trips now since uh, the 13th chapter of this book and here we just want to look at some maybe some more personal items uh, about him i've made several comments there that uh, hopefully will help you on pages 237 238 but let's go down uh, to uh, uh, the second last bullet point before the text of acts 20 the passage before us presents another side or a variety of other characteristics of Paul. Paul was a great encourager. He had a heart full of love and thanksgiving for his Savior and a deep love for Israelites according to the flesh and the people of God in Christ. There's several things worthy of note in chapter 20 in these first 16 verses that reveal to us what I'm going to call the pastoral nature and ministry of Paul the Apostle. 
This passage and what immediately follows details Paul's final mission work as he travels through the Mediterranean world. The three mission journeys from chapter 13 to present cover, cover several years of history, and what will follow then, chapter 21 on, is Paul's journey to Rome. But let's read through these first 16 verses of Acts chapter 20. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derbe and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. These going before tarried for us at Troas. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber, where they were gathered together, and there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep, and as Paul was Long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. And we went before the ship and sailed unto Assos, there intending to take in Paul, for so he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Tregilium. And the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So, um, again, uh, we're moving much more quickly through the book and we will the, the rest of our studies because we're dealing with more history. The places, the people, the things he did. We're not... Um, tied up in a doctrinal controversy uh, in things like that, that we were in establishing uh, context and content and uh, all of those things that we did in the earlier chapters of the book of Acts. Now we're, we're rolling right along. What's going on in Paul's life? We're coming to nearing the end of his third um, missionary journey, and we've chosen to pick out from verse number one the statement, and I quote, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them. This is more than a simple farewell. Remember, we're looking at the person of Paul. What kind of a man was he? His personality and his character in his relationship with these people. This is more than a simple farewell. Paul demonstrates that his passion for the disciples in this case, a church was certainly genuine. The term embrace means more than just a goodbye hug. The idea is spending time in a warm exchange. Genuine affection is contained in the term. The same word is used in Luke chapter 1 where Mary made haste to visit Elizabeth to report the news that she, Mary, was carrying the Messiah. Mary saluted Elizabeth, and this is the same Greek word, saluted Elizabeth. Mary greeted and embraced Elizabeth warmly and affectionately, and the babe leaped in her womb. These people 
were family, and Paul's embrace was that of embracing one's own family. Sometimes um, Paul is presented as a hard, harsh um, individual, an individual who uh, hated women and was intolerant towards those who disagreed with him. Nothing could be further from the truth. When you really study uh, the person of Paul and you study passages, sections uh, uh, out of these chapters like this, you see that he was, uh, yeah, he was a man on a mission. There's no question about that. No question that he was a very disciplined individual. The fact that he was a Pharisee, the fact that he was very orthodox and conservative in his theological, probably in his political beliefs, no doubt, um, those things are true. But that doesn't mean that he couldn't be a man that loved others and had affection toward other individual. Uh, I see that as a balanced individual. I see Christ as a uh, balanced individual and in that he was full of grace and truth that he was a savior of strength and beauty, not just one or the other. So uh, I suppose as human beings, we do have a tendency to gravitate to one side or the other, and I think that's what we enjoy uh, in some personalities when we, when we meet an individual who both is, has self-discipline, is principled, and at the same time, can be very, be very graceful, very kind, and gracious to other individuals. I believe that's the example that Christ has uh, set for us. And I believe that passages like this, we see that Paul the Apostle was an individual like that. So we've written there, contrary to some reports, Paul was a man who loved the disciples, he loved the church, and he loved the churches of Christ. The next uh, emboldened print, uh, 20 verse 2, we quote, when he had given them much exhortation. Paul faced more than his share of opposition and discouraging times. We know that from reading 2 Corinthians chapter 11, which we've included in the text. And if you'll just kind of browse through that text, you can see labors, stripes, prisons, deaths, 40 stripes, beaten with rods, stoned, shipwreck, journeyings, perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils by mine own countrymen, weariness, painfulness, watchings, hunger, thirst, fastings, cold, nakedness. And the last thing he says in verse 28, maybe he saves it up as for the final, you know, this is the thing that tops them all, the care of all the churches. He cared. He had, he, uh, the word care comes from, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, from a Latin word, charis, C-A-R-U-S. The Latin word charis means dear. It means someone who is dear to you. Our word careful comes from that. When you're careful about something, you're careful because whatever the person or the thing is dear to you. So you're very charis with it. You're careful. You're loving. It's dear to you. So anyway, we see that uh, uh, Paul has gone through an awful lot. He went through a lot, but he gave them much exhortation. The word exhortation means to encourage people. The word means to call near, implore, invoke, or comfort people. Human nature is such that when we are encouraged by someone who has overcome or been successful or completed the task, we are psychologically motivated and spurred on to victory. This is what a great coach does. A great coach is somebody who has been successful in the sport that he coaches. Maybe he was an all-star basketball, baseball, football player. Maybe he was the quarterback or the wide receiver, or maybe he set records in his day. And now he's taken his experiences that he learned from his coaches, 
and his experiences in playing, and now he's sharing them with, with uh, the athletes that he's coaching. Uh, so this is the kind of encouragement that we get from somebody who is an accomplished individual, somebody who's been there and done that. Much exhortation. We are exhorted not only by words, but we're motivated by a, a person's example, a knowledge of their experience, a knowledge of their, their love for other people and how it just stands out. You can tell this person really cares. That's the kind of person that Paul the Apostle was. The next thing on our list on 240 is, and there accompanied him into Asia. Uh, several people, a lot of people are mentioned here. Now, Paul and Barnabas started out back in chapter 13, uh, and now we see Sopater, Aristarchus, Secundus, Gaius, Timotheus, Tychicus, Trophimus, and there are others. Luke, uh, not mentioned by name. All of these individuals are companions and followers of Paul the Apostle. So what do we learn about Paul? Uh, not to our surprise, but leaders attract leaders. Paul's personal investment, his discipleship in others, um, because he was unashamed of Christ, it rubbed off on others, and it led to a gathering of devoted individuals who would travel with Paul and work with Paul and counsel Paul and protect Paul. So he had a lot of friends. He was a great leader. He was a great example as a leader. And in so doing, he attracted uh, like individuals who also became great leaders themselves. Paul's love for Christ and the gospel was contagious. He was a man who was deeply committed to the ministry and he was a man who lifted the spirits of all that he came in contact with. You know people like that. There are some people... When they walk in the room, the party begins. And I, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just when so-and-so shows up, you know, boy, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be good. So-and-so is here right now. And it adds value to the event, uh, to the party. And it adds value to all of the other people, in a sense, that are there. Some people are just are contagious in their positive attitude and, and they make other people better. Just having a good <coughs> player on your team uh, makes the rest of the team a better team just because they're playing with somebody who is accomplished, somebody who can be part and wants to be part of what they're doing. Knowing and working with Paul made one a better individual. Always look for people who will challenge you. And let's say, and, and this is a tough thing to measure, I know, but let's say you're here on a spiritual scale or you see yourself honestly here and you look to some people in your church or in the ministry that uh, you look up to because they are accomplished and they have had victories and they are experienced and they are knowledgeable and they are the kind of person that Paul was. Loving other people and exhorting other people. And you are here. Look for people like that. Follow people like that. Try to emulate people like that. Rather than sinking to a level lower than yourself, it's easy to find bad <laughs> examples in life. And, and hopefully it's not easy for you to follow them. It is human nature to be lazy, to be neglectful, to be self-centered, to not care about anybody else. I know I'm human. That's my nature. But above that, to be above that, it is, uh, uh, is uh, encouraging. It's stimulating to look to people that do better than you or you, uh, you, you uh, see as better than you and then trying to be like them for the right reasons, for the glory of God. So he attracted leaders. And then it says Paul preached to them. Bottom of page 240, verse number 7. The ministry, teaching, and preaching of the word of God was central to the ministry. We see that everywhere. Look for people who keep Jesus 
at the center of their relationship, of their Christianity. Your pastor, your youth director, your missionaries, the superintendent of the Sunday schools, just good disciples in your church, leaders in your church, men and women alike who, are, who uh, show their love for Christ, follow those people and try to emulate them. The ministry, teaching, and preaching of the word was central to his ministry. Look for people who put Jesus at the center of their lives. Verse 7 implies that Paul was never short on words. He preached until midnight. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I've been in a couple meetings like that. That wasn't the intention when it started, but it ended up that way. I never fell asleep, though, and never was taken up dead. Um, maybe some people thought I was, but I... Uh, my recollection is that I survived those. But anyway, uh, Paul wasn't short on words. When he had an, an opportunity to do something, he took that opportunity uh, to the fullest extent. Paul wasn't impressed by his own experiences. He wasn't impressed by his own opinions. He didn't walk around telling people, at least not recorded in the book of Acts, look what I've done, look where I've been, look who I know, et cetera, et cetera. He didn't do that. He didn't brag on himself. He bragged on Jesus, he preached the word, and he understood that nothing could be more helpful or more encouraging to another individual than just preaching Christ to them. In verse 7, we also see he continued to midnight. He has covered over 6,000 miles of travel. Not by car, train, or plane either, my friend. We understand that the travel accommodations were relatively unimaginable compared to what you and I would enjoy in our travels today. Considering all of the setbacks and obstacles that Paul incurred in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, they're noted there, Paul was a man on a mission. He would not quit. He would not give up. He was undaunted. He never complained about the obstacles his opponents, those who uh, would um, uh, create problems for him. He was positive in his teaching and his preaching, and he would move from one place to the next as a man, truly a man on a mission. A great example of that. He worked as a tent maker throughout his ministry to avoid being a financial liability to those to whom he ministered. By the way, he could have been there was nothing wrong. The laborer is worthy of his hire. There's no question about that. Um, but at the same time, he did not want anyone to use um, money as an excuse not to listen to him. We see some other things there. <clears throat> uh, something else in verse 7 that I think is worthy of note is the idea of the first day of the week. Notice in verse 7, the apostles and disciples met on the first day of the week. We see the same thing reinforced in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 2, where it says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. Now, the Sabbath was made to be a sign between Jehovah and the nation of Israel. It is believed, though, that the first day of the week, Sunday, became the primary gathering day for the church on the basis of the resurrection of Christ because Christ rose on the first day of the week. The Sabbath day is the seventh day. The first day of the week we call Sunday is the day that we generally recognize as a day of worship in the Christian world. And I'll leave it at that. There's more that could be said, but I'll just leave it at that. Then notice at the bottom of 241, Paul fell on him. This is embracing Eutychus as the young man. He had had enough of Paul's preaching, apparently, and uh, fell asleep, uh, lost his place or his position in the loft, and ended up uh, taking a nasty fall. Um, it's believed that he was a young man, 10, 14, 10 to 14 years of age, been a long day, uh, he fell asleep. Who hasn't been there? Who hasn't been there by midnight 
and it's been a long day and you're listening to somebody talk, I don't care how interesting they are, maybe you're sitting up watching uh, a uh, award-winning movie at midnight and you find yourself at 1.15 with a test pattern in front of you or, or who knows, some weather program or whatnot and you've been asleep for the last uh, 45 minutes, who ha hasn't had that happen uh, to them? And that's what happened, obviously, apparently, to this young man, Eutychus. Well, anyway, Paul, he, he's taken up dead. Everybody thinks that he is lost. Or he, is, he has lost his life, verse number 9. And Luke was a physician, remember? He's reporting on this. So Luke was probably uh, a believer, was impressed that he was uh, dead. Paul says, though, his life is in him. And one can only surmise that a miracle has taken place. This is the last miracle that Paul performed in the book of Acts. Now, this is only chapter 20. We've got eight more chapters that follow. Paul is the central figure of the rest of the book, but we don't see Paul on a miracle-producing binge. It's our belief that as the Word of God grew, and ultimately the texts the letters that were written to the churches, the gospels were made available to believers, that there were more believers, that the signs and wonders of the apostles, that they were diminished. And that is the record of the book of Acts. We don't see the uh, speaking in tongues. We don't see the healing miracles. We don't see, the, we don't see Paul walking on water or drinking poison, or Mark chapter 16, or any of those things. We don't see that taking place in the rest of the book. The only thing that I would say would be, I think it's in chapter 27, where Paul gets bit by a serpent. And that would take us back to Mark chapter 16. Uh, 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 and that would be the only exception to that that I can think of off the top of my head right now. But this would be the last miracle if indeed it is a miracle maybe he wasn't dead I don't know but Paul says his life is still in him and if he was dead this is the last miracle that Paul uh, performs in the book the event though brought comfort courage and confidence to the church there was indeed no doubt that this Paul had an anointing of God on his life something that was very bad turned out to be something very, very good, for sure. Now let's turn the page here and look uh, in verse number 16. I'm going to skip the marks of good preaching. I'll make a comment before we're done on that. But let's look, lastly, page 242. Paul hasted to be at Jerusalem. Paul spent a large amount of time at the city of Ephesus, however... At this time, he was compelled to be at Jerusalem. Paul knew that if he went to, to Ephesus, it would be difficult to leave, so he avoided the risk by uh, slipping on by. Why Jerusalem? Because Paul didn't want to be a stumbling block to Jews. So Paul wanted to show up at Pentecost at Jerusalem so that he wouldn't be criticized for abandoning the Old Testament law. He never said that the Old Testament law was evil or bad. In fact, the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, both of those books and others certainly attest to the fact that the law was good, but the law could not save. So rather than be a bad testimony and just reject outrightly the law and the pra all the practices of the law, Paul determined that he would show up at Jerusalem at one of the required feasts. But not only for that reason, he knew there'd be a lot of people there, <laughs> Jews. And he would have a great opportunity to take the gospel of Jesus Christ and probably reach more people uh, at that particular time in that particular place in his ministry than any other place. So this uh, he did because he saw great advantage, at least twofold, to be a good testimony and not a stumbling block, and also to seize the opportunity to preach the gospel to a million people. A million people. It's said that, that in Jerusalem, 
uh, at these great feasts that there could be as many as a million people that would assemble at those times. So anyway, we've got some other things that we say here uh, through the end of the notes, but let's go back to the Mark's a good preaching and I'll finish up. Mark's a good preaching. I like alliterations. This is one that I came up with years ago and I still, I can live by it. You might be able to add one or you may come up with your own list. But what makes good preaching? Um, personal. What do I mean by that? That the people that you are addressing feel as though that you are talking to them, specifically talking to them. And you can do that by the choice of your words and the direction of the attention that you give the people that are there. Sometimes you can actually talk to your crowd. If you know some of the people, call people out by name and say, well, don't you, do you agree with me, Tom? Or what do you think about that? Or Not that you necessarily have to call them out and ask for a response to them, but um, connecting with your crowd in a more personal way. What you have to say needs to be applicable, relevant, pertinent to them it's got to be something that they want to know about they w and if they don't your job is to make them want to know about it and tell them why this is so important and what can be gained by listening to what you have to say it needs to be practical useful and sensible it needs to be something that you can help people come to the conclusion that this can be done by the grace of God, but with the help of God, and that it needs to be done. It needs to be positive, transformational, constructive, rather than destructive. <laughs> it needs to be powerful. And what I mean by that is the word power is, often means authority or authoritative. So when I say powerful, it needs to be authoritative in that what is said is based upon something that is found in the Word of God. It is authoritative. It is principled. It is true, undoubtedly. And if, it, if you're not sure that it's true, if it's an opinion, be honest with people and state it as such. Don't pit, tell people something is true if you're just guessing at it. Don't do that. Be honest with people. In fact, if people ask you a question and you don't know the answer, simply say, let me get back to you on that, and then do it. Follow through. Don't give them a, a guess answer that's off the top of your head that might, might not be right. Wrong. You are only jeopardizing your credibility by doing that. So be honest with people and say, you know, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'll get back to you, and I'll, tr I'll try to get the best answer I can find. Is that okay? Then you continue your conversation with that person. That's, that's good. So powerful, principled, and purposeful, directed to a specific goal or response. And I believe that that's important. When we preach, we need to, we need to come to the end of the sermon, and we need to say, now, this is what I believe we should do as a result of what we've heard. Are you willing to do that for these reasons? Everybody makes a decision in every sermon. Do you understand that? The preacher may not ask you to, to, to make a decision, but I think that it's a good idea to do that or at least imply that. You need to decide to do something about what you have heard here. Do you understand? Uh, I like invitations. I like to get responses. I know some people are very uncomfortable with uh, in-seat and hand-raising invitations. I understand that, uh, and I understand why. However, I think there's value in getting a person in a confidential environment to get people to say, yes, I heard what you said. That applies to me. I really need to do something about that. I think that's good. I think inviting people to come forward. Not that this has to be, either of these things has to be done at every invitation, but inviting people to come forward to pray about it or have somebody pray with them. There's value in that. I don't think either of those things need to be done in every sermon, but I do believe that you need to imply that a decision needs to be made 
based on the truth that has been presented to your audience in your message. So it needs to be directed to a specific goal or purpose. All right. We're going to take a break here in just a second, and we're going to move on to the remainder of chapter 20. And I like this. I like, uh, I've preached on this passage many times. The, this passage deals with Paul's last words to the Ephesian church. And the reason why this particular lesson is so important, and I'll restate it when we begin again, is simply this. This is the only message that's recorded in the book of Acts that was preached specifically to a saved or to a Christian audience. And I think because of that, there's some very valuable things to gain from Acts chapter 20 down through 17 through the end of the chapter. We'll come back to that.